Well, blessings, everybody, and welcome to Answers. I am Dale. I'm so glad you have joined with me today. Uh, and this is a special program. I'm sort of excited about this because I want to set you free over some stuff. Okay? Are you ready to be set free? Danny, you ready to be set free, brother? Maybe. Yeah, there we go. Danny's, Danny runs everything back here. He's the one that takes care of all the stuff. My favorite Danny thing is this, that in between the breaks when you hear the music, he's singing along with it. And so he's rejoicing and giving thanks to the Lord. And so if everything has gone well, you're watching this program a few days before Christmas, the year 2011. If you're watching it on the computer, sometimes afterwards, or maybe even before, some of y'all have learned it will post these things a little earlier, right? Uh, then I thank you because the truth that we're about to see right here, I really think will set us free. Because, you know, uh, the enemy really seeks to do just a few things. He seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. Okay? And he does that in a multitude of ways, particularly with those who are believers. He'll seek to come in and bring forth all sorts of controversy and all sorts of problems and people have questions about things. Well, that's the premise of this entire time together. This the reason we call the program Answers is we seek out the Word of God and we search the Word of God as to what he says about the questions that we have. And we find out quite often that the questions that come up are nothing new, really, that God has addressed them somewhere along the way at some time, in some form, or in some fashion. And so uh, today I want to deal with one particular thing that arose uh, several weeks ago, but it has application for a lot of other things. And I just want to read what the Word of God has to say about some stuff and sort of tie it in together. So, have I got your uh, appetite sort of whetted here for something? I hope so. Uh, here's what brought all this up. When I first heard about this, probably several months, if not a couple of years ago, and it, was, it became quite the uh, internet hubbub here back in the first part of November, the end of October this year. And it has to do with turkeys. With turkeys. Yes, it has to do with turkeys. And here's what the issue is. Uh, have you ever heard about food being kosher? Okay, something being kosher. Well, what kosher means is that the food has been prepared a certain kind of way. It's been prepared according to the Levitical law, according to the dietary laws of the Mosaic law that God gave to the children of Israel and said, hey, here's the way that you're supposed to prepare food. Here's the kind of food that you can eat, and this is the process. Well, if something is kosher, that means that it's been prepared in that way. And so it goes into quiet detail. And, and you've seen Hebrew national hot dogs, that kind of thing, kosher hot dogs and this kind of stuff. It's been pre prepared in a particular kind of way. Uh, the animals or the grain or whatever has been raised in a particular kind of way. There's been a priest or someone like that that has come along and that has prayed particular kind of prayers and blessed the facility and the manufacturing. And it's just a whole process involved with that. And so we're somewhat familiar with that term as far as uh, Judaism. And so it's not that uh, unusual for us to encounter something like that. But there's been something new of late. And it's been going on, like I said, for some period of time. But it's just become somewhat public knowledge. We're seeing the same type of thing, but it's being done in the name of Allah. It's being done in Islam. And it's referred to as halal, H-A-L-A-H. -A -A and what that means is that the food is halal, I guess is the way to say it. I'm not even quite sure what the proper way of phrasing that is. But what they're saying is that this food has been prepared according to Islamic law, okay? According to Sharia law, it has been prepared. And there's, uh, I've read some of the details as to what it is. It actually goes way beyond even what God said with the kosher law, well, obviously, because we're not talking about the same God, okay? But what is being done is that uh, Alu Akbar is being spoken over food, over processes, over things like this. Well, it happened this year that it came out that butterball turkeys were part of this process. Now, I'm quite certain that this is more just a, a marketing thing. It's just a thing that they're trying to reach uh, as many customers as possible, okay? I have no problem with that kind of thing. And if you actually went to the Butterball website, uh, you would see that, yeah, they on one of their pages it said that their uh, products are FDA, remember that Food and Drug Administration? FDA approved, halal certified, okay? And they had a bunch of these organizations that certified the preparation of the food and all this. And well, when you start looking around, you see there's little symbols that certify these type of things. And there's like a dozen of them that I've run across so far. And there's a lot of products 
that have this type of certification, this kind of thing. Well, immediately there's hubbub, right? People go, well, I don't know about this. What's going on with this kind of stuff? What am I supposed to do? And I had several folks, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, how, how do I know if this turkey is this or that? <laughs> and so I gave them a, a really uh, simple answer to that without being flippant, but I'm sure I sounded flippant when I said it. And I said, well, get, some, get a good ham. Okay? Just get one of those nice honey-baked spiral sliced ham. <laughs> and if you don't get the joke with that, the joke is this. Well, in kosher, in the Jewish thing, they, they don't eat pigs. They don't eat pork in any way, right? Same way with uh, Islam. They don't touch pork, anything like that. So if you're concerned about something, having the halal speaking of it, well, the best way to do it is just eat a pork product, and I guarantee you that it won't be. But let me set you free with some stuff, folks. There's nothing new with the fear that comes upon us in some of these things, okay? Because it's just an attack and the strategy of the evil one. And I'm going to read some scripture today. We may get through it all today. If we don't, we'll pick it up the next time together, okay? That relates to this exact type of argument and what was occurring and what was going on in the early church. And the early church had the same type of situation and the same type of thing. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians. I love that church at Corinth. That church at Corinth, that the gathering, the body of Christ that was there in that city, uh, we see ourselves so much in that. And let me just remind you a couple things. Paul had told us, man, y'all got all the gifts. You've got everything. Man, you've got so much good stuff going on there. And he just praised them. He just thanked the Lord for them. He said, but you know, you got some problems going there. So you need to deal with some of these things. First of all, I hear there's some division among, among you. Some of you say that I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Jesus, I'm of Peter. And he said, you shouldn't be that way. He said, also, I hear that you're sort of overlooking some sin. you got a dude right there that's having an affair with his father's wife. You're not doing anything about it. You shouldn't be doing that. He said, also, I hear that some of you are suing each other. He said, why are you doing that? He said, you're taking cases before the, the pagan courts, the courts of the world. Can't you decide? And so when you see the things that are happening within the church at Corinth, you say, hey, that sounds a lot like what's going on with us. Uh, they had some problems with spiritual gifts. You know, how... Uh, how should we do this, these things? And can you imagine they had a problem with two spiritual gifts? Prophecy and speaking in tongues. You see that in 1 Corinthians 14. Same problem within the body of Christ today. But in 1 Corinthians 8, he deals with something that's an issue. And something that was a problem. And I think it will help us a lot to look at what the scripture has to say here. And uh, that and the principles. And sort of see where we go from there, okay? He, uh, Paul says this, first verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. And you say, well, what is it? Knowledge and puffing up and all this? When you read various translations of this, it's sort of interesting to see what's being said right here. But what he's saying is, okay, now concerning these idols and the things offered to idols, everybody has an opinion. <laughs> There's knowledge involved in this. But if you're not careful, you can have absolute knowledge and be correct in your knowledge and yet be arrogant and puffed up about it and sin in the way that you're coming across with it. You see that a lot. You saw that with the Pharisees, this Pharisaical thing. They could be absolutely right in something. But the way that they were manifesting, and the way they were being puffed up was incorrect. So he, Paul wanted to give them a word of warning about that. So he says this, Therefore, concerning the things, uh, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no other God but one. And this speaks directly to what we're talking about with the issue of the day. He's saying, we know there's no such thing as an idol, and there really is no such thing as an idol. And there's no other God but one. There is only one God, the Lord Most High, and His Son, Yeshua HaMashiach, and the Holy Spirit, and the wonder and the mystery that is the triune nature of God. There is only one God. The Muslims, the Islamic people, will say that we worship the same God, Allah. No, no. They'll say that to our face, but they don't believe that because it's not the truth. Allah and the Most High God are not the same God. Our political leaders will say that they are the same God. It's just political correctness and it's just expediency, but it's not true. There is only one God. And so I can tell you flat out from the very beginning what Paul is about to express here through the Holy Spirit that if there is no God and we know that somebody praying some prayer, declaring something over a turkey, 
Okay, That does not make that an idol. There is no such thing. There's no problem with that. Go ahead and eat the thing. But, and here's the but, and here's where the principle applies. There is love. And love, the love of God, agapio, the love that we have for one another and that God has for us, wants what is best for the other individual. And that's the truth we're about to see. So watch this. Paul says this. For even if there are so-called gods, okay, a so-called God, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, what he's saying is, man, man has come up with many gods. Man has come up with many lords. He says, even if there are many of these so-called gods, yet for us there is one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. That little phrase right there is amazing. I would really encourage you to go read this eighth chapter of First Corinthians. Okay, make sure you read it before you lay down and not go to sleep, because he says something really interesting right here. We know there's one God, the Father of whom are all things. The Father God of whom are all things. We know that, and we for Him. All things are of him, and we are for him. And the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things. Little distinction right there. And what you see, you see it all the way back to Genesis 1, and you see it in several places in Scripture. That God created everything. Father, yes. But the Lord Jesus Christ spoke it into existence. He spoke it into existence. And through whom we live. We live through the Lord Jesus Christ for Father God. Don't ever forget that the Lord died on the cross, was buried, resurrected on the third day to reconcile mankind to the Father. Yes, we worship the Lord Jesus Christ, but sometimes I think we forget what was done to reconcile us to God because we were separated from God due to sin. And so that's what he's reminding right? We, we know there's only one God. He says, so I'm not going to worry about this idol. But, however, first word, the seventh verse, however, there is not in everyone that knowledge. Not everybody has the knowledge that I just communicated there with you. Not everybody knows that there's only one God. Not everybody knows that there's no such thing as an idol. Not everybody knows some things that we'll see either later or next week that there is... Um, Nothing unclean. Not everybody knows that. Until now, it is as... Uh, well, let me back up. However, there is not everyone that has that knowledge. For some, with consciousness of the idol, until now, eat it as a thing offered to the idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat, are we the worst? So what Paul is doing, what the Lord is leading to the Holy Spirit is an appeal to the conscious. And here's what it is. He's saying somebody will be a believer. They're a true believer, folks. Okay, they're a true believer. And yet, if they eat that roast that was offered to an idol, which is what the issue was, could they buy meat at the marketplace not knowing where it came from, knowing that a lot of it came as an offering to an idol. They'd offer it to an idol and they'd turn around and sell it through the back door. They would be eating that roast and they'd be thinking this thing might have been offered to idol and their conscience was bothering them. They're called a weak brother. Not an inferior brother, just a weaker brother because their conscience is bothering them. Paul says, I have no problem with that whatsoever because I know there's no such thing as idol. Slice me off a piece of that steak. You know? But he says, there are some who don't have that knowledge and they are weaker brothers. And for the sake of conscience, some things need to be done right here. We're not any better if we do eat. We're not any better if we don't eat. But we need to honor and walk in love before one another. Look at verse 9. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. Okay, the stumbling block would have been that you have the liberty to eat something and do whatever. Because the scripture tells us we're free to eat and drink whatever we desire. The scripture tells us. Now the scripture tells us some things about that. Okay, we're not to get drunk. Okay, the scripture's point blank about that. We're not to be gluttons. The scripture's point blank about that. And so what it has to do with is with abundance of that that we're eating and drinking, okay? But he says, don't let your liberty to eat or drink be a stumbling block. Verse 10. 
For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, now this is just not picking up something out on at the market and going home that might have been offered to them. That's actually being in the temple of the idol. Okay, being, if they see you in there, will not the conscience of him who is awake be emboldened to eat those things offered to the idol? What he's saying is this. If somebody sees you eating like that, they're going to think, well, they're doing that, so that must be okay. It sort of bothers me to do it, but if they're doing it, then that's all right, then I'm going to go ahead and do it. And that's not right. If your conscience is bothering you over that, then don't do it. And if you're a weaker brother within that, that's, again, not inferior. It's not a lesser brother in any way. Nothing like that. But you don't want to cause a brother to stumble because later on it's going to tell us that you are not. If your conscience bothers you, then don't participate in it. Don't ride along on the coattails of somebody else's consciousness and eating that roast or eating that steak. Okay? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Now, we're going to look at some other scripture here in a moment. Maybe next week, too. Uh, that shows us some things about this eating right here and this stumbling. But what he's saying is we want to do things in love in such a way that nobody stumbles. What we're going to see is this. If someone comes and uh, you're free to go to their house and eat, if they set something before you, then you eat whatever's set before you. But if they tell you and, and they say, hey, this turkey right here was presented... Uh, before a pagan god, then don't eat of it for conscience sake. Not your conscience, but their conscience. Because they're the ones making a big deal about what's, ha what's being said right here, okay? Now, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, take a little break right here, and then we're going to come back, and I want to pick up the same principle related to something else. So hang with me. I'll be right back. You have always wanted to play the piano, but thought it was too late. Or, in the past you played the piano, but you do not play anymore. Or, you've always considered yourself to be unmusical, yet there is something driving you to express yourself through music. It is not too late. Now is the time. Simply Music has come to Alabama. Coleman is the only Alabama location of this revolutionary method. Come, join us, make music. Welcome back to Answers. We are looking at some things of how to handle uh, what sometimes is referred to as controversial practices or what we should do and how we should address some things. And the bottom line is this, that we are at liberty as true believers within this life. We are at liberty. We have tremendous freedom, more freedom than most of us know. But also we are not to do things which would cause a brother to stumble. Now notice it's the, the phrase is used as brother. You see in 1 Corinthians 8, you see in 1 Corinthians 10. Right now I'm going to take us to Romans 14 very quickly. And I want to apply this not only to the eating of things which we're about to see, but also to something else that comes up. And I think this will really help us with a lot of things. So this is 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Now there it is, the weak thing, okay? They're, they were thinking, they're, they're a believer, but they're weak because of conscience and they're weak in the faith and they don't want to eat that meat because they're afraid that it might be offered to an idol. That's fine. That's fine. You don't look down upon them. Okay, that's what 1 Corinthians 10, you don't look down upon them. One's not better than the other. We just receive one another. We love one another. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. Okay, so I'm not going to sit there and despise someone who doesn't eat something. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. And the one who does not eat, 
should not sit there and say, well, that, that piece of meat might have been offered an idol. No, we don't do that. We receive one another. Now watch this. Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Now this right here I think is really sort of important for us to see what I'm about to read right here, particularly in relationship to um, something like Christmas, for instance. Okay, it's the Christmas season and all this kind of stuff. Some people want to celebrate Christmas extravagantly. They're true believers. Other people want to totally ignore that. They're true believers. We have both history within our nation. Were you aware of that? Did you know that for years and years and years it was against the law in several states to celebrate Christmas? The Puritans would not celebrate, wouldn't touch it, wouldn't do anything with it. And there's good reasons for that. I could sit here and I started to do that and I thought, I'm going to talk about this. I think this is a little more edifying for us. But just about every element that we associate with Christmas and celebration has deep, deep, deep pagan roots. As a matter of fact, the time of the year and the celebrating of Christmas is actually tied into Saturnalia. And if you look at the uh, church of the 4th and 5th century, what you see is the church was trying to sanitize some pagan holidays, uh, particularly Saturnalia. And then the one in the spring where we have Easter now, okay? That was uh, an attempted sanitizing of a particular pagan holiday. Didn't work particularly well. But the things that we have that are involved with it, whether it's the uh, Christmas trees or the creches and all these kind of things, these are all things which really have very deep pagan roots. Okay? Now, here's the deal. For the most part, we don't worship the tree. But somebody might be distracted by that and by their conscience, they don't want to put one up. Well, that's wonderful. That's fine. Somebody else may say, well, I have freedom to put this up and to celebrate and remember the birth of Lord Jesus Christ. Wonderful. There's no problem with that. Nowhere in the scripture are we told to celebrate the birth of Jesus. But there's nothing inherently wrong with it. What I think is really cool about it is for us to pay attention. Because in the same way that he came the first time, all those prophecies fulfilled and all the stuff the Lord tells us in Matthew and Luke about his coming the first time, it's going to be fulfilled the second time. And the scripture says really a whole lot more about his coming the second time. Okay? And that's wonderful. You know, I do have a problem sometimes because when you see all the little, uh, the creches, you know, the, the scenes where you see the baby Jesus there and the wise men, the shepherds, all that. The problem I have with that is they're not what the scripture says. The wise men came many, many months later. Okay? That kind of thing. And I think we communicate things that are untrue. And then we also get into entire things that are totally unbiblical and you know what some of those are. But the truth I want us to read right here in our final three minutes together is this. That one man may be fully convinced that one day needs, needs to be celebrated and another, day, another man may think, well, no, all days are the same. It's fine. Listen to what the Lord says. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes today observes it to the Lord. So if you observe, for instance, Christmas like that, you observe it unto the Lord. Wonderful. And he who does not observe today to the Lord, he does not observe it. That's wonderful. No problem. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat, and he gives God thanks. So he's saying you may have the freedom to eat, and you're eating and drinking. Thanks to the Lord. Wonderful. Somebody else says, no, I don't think I can eat that because of my conscience. Wonderful. You're both giving thanks to God. There's no problem. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. So he's saying whether you live to something or die to something, in other words, you decide to set it aside, I'm not going to deal with it, I'm not going to partake of it. I think that's wonderful. You're doing it to the Lord. You say, I am going to partake of that. Wonderful if you do it unto the Lord. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Now, why do you show contempt for your brother? But we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another any more, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in your brother's way. Now listen to these last few verses. This brings it all together. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. 
Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable and approved by God. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things which will edify one another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things are indeed pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat or drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats. For he who does not eat from faith, for whatever is not of faith is sin. So here's what's being said. If, the, if it moves upon your conscience not to eat of something, that's wonderful. If you feel totally free to eat something, that is fine too. There's no problem. But if I know that it's offensive to my brother Danny over here that I eat hamburgers, I'm not going to eat a hamburger in front of Danny. Okay? If I know it's offensive to him and I might have an encounter and meet him out and about somewhere, I'm not going to take that chance. And you say, well, that's being a hypocrite. No, it's not. It's walking in humility. It's dying to self and it's walking in love before one another. Now, when it says that little line, hey, are you free? Do you have faith? Then have it yourself before God. You know what? That means I'm going to grill a big, fat, juicy one, Danny, at home. You know? And have the hamburger there. But I'm not going to do anything that's going to cause my brother to stumble and offend my brother. And so we see right here, in just these two portions of the Scripture, and there's several others I could go to, of how we handle these things. Folks, we are free and we are at liberty. There's no such thing as an idol. If someone has spoken some hocus-pocus over a piece of turkey right there, don't worry about it. If someone sets it before you and says, this has been offered to the God Allah, I'd like for you to join with me, then you say, well, I, I can't do that, but I love you. I love you, but you can't do that because of conscious sake. Not your conscious, but their conscious. What difference would it make within the body of Christ if we were to walk and to live in this way and handle things which are sometimes divisive issues in this way? I think it would totally transform us. Let me pray for us, okay? Lord, I thank you for the truth that you've given us of how to handle these kind of things. Lord, may we walk in your wisdom, not with the arrogance and the knowledge that puffs up what was spoken of at the very beginning, but Lord, with love that comes and that we die of the self and we walk in humility before one another, wanting what is best for one another. Lord, may these truths right here ring in our head as we go through issue after issue and encounter after encounter every day. And may you be glorified in everything. To your praise and your honor and glory we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being with me, and I'll see you again next time on Answers. Bye-bye.